During the next hour and a half, NBC and its affiliated independent stations will bring you a special Christmas Eve program conceived by the boys who are far from home this Christmas season and including a talk by the President of the United States. In order that we may bring it to you, the following programs have been canceled over many of these stations. Amos and Andy, who will have as their guest next week, Edward G. Robinson, Bill Stern's Sports Newsreel, and Fred Waring in Pleasure Time. Hollywood to conduct this worldwide tour are Lionel Barrymore, Bing Crosby, and Bob Hope. And now, let me introduce the man whose portrayal of Scrooge from Dickens' Immortal Christmas Carol has become an American tradition this time of the year, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Well, this is Lionel Barrymore in Hollywood, and here it's Christmas Eve the third our country's experience in the war. But tonight, I'm not going to play the part of Scrooge. Let me rather take you people of America by the hand to the side of your loved ones fighting in every quarter of the globe. Our president and commander-in-chief is with us, too. He'll speak to our armed forces, and then he has a word for us as well. We're going to Italy, North Africa, to New Guinea, Guadalcanal, New Caledonia. Yes, and for the first time on the radio, we'll take you to Munda. We'll visit China, where it already is Christmas. And we'll go to India, Panama, and Alaska, Pearl Harbor, and some of our ships of the Navy. Yes, in this, our third year of war, we Americans are going to spend Christmas Eve at the fighting front of our men as they light up Christmas trees all over the world. Now, no program of this type would be complete without the presence of a certain young man. His name is synonymous with joy to the G.I.s, and he's had the thrill of meeting most of them face to face, too. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the guest conductor of this worldwide tour, Bob Hope. Thank you, relatives. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> this is Bob Christmas Eve Hope telling all you Americans to keep backing up our boys, and when Santa comes down from the ice and snow, he'll find us sticking together like Franklin, Winston, and Joe. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm very happy to be on this wonderful Christmas Eve show. Christmas is so exciting here. You should see the Christmas trees in Hollywood Boulevard tonight. They floated down from the Yukon last week. <laughs> mean to say that the snow has been that loose everywhere. I understand it's so cold in the Middle West that even the Republicans are waiting for the fireside chats. <laughs> but Christmas spirit really prevails in Hollywood. All the boys in the service are visiting the canteen. You know what the Hollywood canteen is? That's the only place in the world where a private is happier with one star in his arms than he would be with four on his shoulder. I saw... I saw W.C. Fields at the canteen, and he sat next to me, but that's beside the pint. You should... You should see his nose now that they lifted the dim out. It's wonderful. But I love Christmas because that's the time of the year that all my relatives come over and sit around the tree. And to think that only a few years ago, most of them were sitting in it. <laughs> and... <laughs> it sneaks up on you, doesn't it, huh? <laughs> and you should, uh, you should see the Christmas cards I got this year. I got one card from Dorothy Lamour with a picture of her and a sarong on it. What a picture. You know how George Washington looks straight ahead on a two-cent stamp? Well, in this envelope, he keeps peeking over his shoulder. <laughs> I got a lot of presents, but I received one present and I heard ticking, so I threw it right into the bathtub, but I'm afraid I was a little hasty. Now I've got the only clock in the world where the cuckoo comes out every hour and blows bubbles. <laughs> Crosby gave his kids Indian outfits with real feathers. I don't know where he got the feathers. All I know is that yesterday I saw a stork flying over Los Angeles in a bathrobe. <laughs> And now for a visit with the men in North Africa. We go across the Atlantic and down the Mediterranean to Algiers. 
It's now after 3 o'clock on Christmas morning in Algiers. Less than two hours ago, the last soldier of the midnight mass checked in his dark. It's quiet now, but in this headquarters, city men and women are working. There are the truck drivers and railway engineers getting supplies up forward. The anti-aircraft gunners watching. The signal operators sending messages. In a few hours, another working day begins for everyone. But in spite of work and war, the generous spirit of Christmas is not forgotten. Hardly a barracks or company street is without its old-fashioned American Christmas tree. And hundreds of parties have been given by Army and Navy men for the children of North Africa. A typical one took place this afternoon at the Red Cross Club, where the men of the 12th Air Force Fighter Command to entertain French war orphans. Here's one of the French-speaking senators, Sergeant John Stewart of Sheffield, Alabama. Sergeant, did the youngsters enjoy themselves? You never saw 56 kids to happen next time. They haven't had much in the past few years. And the fighter command has rather adopted them. We're going to give them their Christmas dinner tomorrow. What happened at the party? Well, there was French and American girl singing. A Mickey Mouse movie. And we gave each boy and girl his own big shopping basket full of woolen clothes, toys, candy, nuts, and fruit. The men in the fighter command had contributed money and their rations. And even Christmas food from home. Thank you, Sergeant Stewart. We in Africa are with you at home in spirit tonight. If Bing Crosby is around, tell him to wrap up a Christmas carol and put it under a Christmas tree for us. We return you to America. Glad to oblige, boys. Major Eddie Dunstetter and the Army Air Forces Orchestra is here with us. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. And now to meet some of the men of the Navy's air arm, we take you to one of the fightingest carriers of them all, a ship whose name and location must remain secret. Now we are speaking to you from one of the greatest fighting ships in the United States Navy, an aircraft carrier. This is a flat top. We are gathered here on the hangar deck this Christmas Eve, and a Christmas party is in full swing. That's the noise you hear in the background. But here's a Christmas party the likes of which you've never seen before. We're at one end of a tremendous room. In front of us in the cleared space is a gaily decorated Christmas tree glowing with lights of every color. Grouped about the tree, exchanging gifts, are members of the crew, and beyond the crew, one can see airplane after airplane. These men in this aircraft carrier have been in the thick of action ever since the war started. We'd like very much to tell you of their gallant war record, where they've been and what they've done, but that accounting must wait. Suffice to say, the enemy has felt the sting and blows of this floating airport time and time again. Well, now let's move over toward the Christmas tree and meet a few of the crew members. Good evening, sailor. What's your duty aboard ship? I'm a signalman. What's your actual duty? I stand by to receive signals that may change the course and speed of our ship. And how do you like spending Christmas Eve aboard an aircraft carrier? Well, naturally, I'd like to be spending at home with the folks, but I think I have a mighty important job to do here. Good for you, lad. Now, here's a bosun made second class. So what's your battle station, sailor? Sky forward. And where's that? Uh, the control station in the forward part of the ship. What do you do there? I uh, help the guns get on target. And where do you hope to be next Christmas? Oh, wrapped around a big piece of lemon pie at home or on Liberty in Tokyo. <laughs> Good for you. Here's another sailor. Uh, how many Christmas Eves have you spent aboard this uh, carrier since uh, war was declared? Four. 
Uh, your fourth? That's right. Yes, but wait a minute now. This is only the third Christmas since war was declared, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, one Christmas we crossed international dateline, had two Christmases t- uh, two days in a row. <laughs> Christmas two days in a row. You have a, you've had all sorts of Christmas celebrations. Are you looking forward to next Christmas? Sure I am. Looking forward to be back in Tennessee. Boy, boy. <laughs> I'll bet you'll be there, too. And now, men, may I have your attention, please? We are broadcasting a portion of our Christmas party all over the world. Would you like to shout your greetings to everyone listening in? Ah, that's grand. And now from this aircraft carrier to meet some of the boys in the Merchant Marine, we go to the Siemens Church Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't think you've met anyone quite like Chief Steward George Jack Kessel of the Merchant Marine, who is here with us at the Siemens Church Institute. Chief Kessel was torpedoed in the Indian Ocean, spent 20 days in a life raft with 14 other survivors. Well, Chief, suppose you tell us about it. Well, when the ship was hit, I was below playing my mandolin. I ran up on deck and tossed the mandolin into my lifeboat. Then when I went, then I went around trying to scare up some food. But as it turned out later, the mandolin was almost as important. Important as food? Why was that? Well, we needed more than food and water to keep our courage up. So I'd start singing and playing all the old favorites at first. Then later, I started making up songs of my own about the boys in the boat, the folks at home, and the things we talked about mostly, mostly home. Well, tell us some of the titles. Well, I wrote Hats Off to the Merchant Marine, Heroes and Dungarees, Please Stay Out of My Dreams, I Haven't Forgotten the Thrill of Your Kiss, Let's Turn Back the Clock, and some others. Well, I've really heard your songs, and I think they're swell. But tell me, did they really help? Yes, sir, they sure helped a lot. One biscuit and five ounces of water a day isn't very much to go on for 20 days. Without those songs, the boys all felt that we couldn't have made it. Well, Chief, you're probably the only composer who ever wrote his songs in a life raft. And I'll bet no composer ever had a more appreciative audience. Well, I know this. Nobody, songwriter or not, ever sailed with finer men than I've lived and worked with in the Merchant Marine for the last 15 years. And you can bet this. We'll keep them sailing until we win. Well, thanks, Chief Steward George Jack Kessel, who turned back death at sea with a song. And now, friends, one of the outfits sharing in the credit of winning the Battle of the Atlantic is the United States Coast Guard. So for a Christmas Eve visit to these boys, we take you aboard a Coast Guard cutter. Here we are aboard a Coast Guard cutter. <laughs> After taking a peek at his face, I'm going to lay six to five. He doesn't even make the arch. But he finally gets there with everybody laughing and clapping their hands, and the preacher comes forward, and Dave the dude looks happy. and never seen him look before in his life as they all get together under the arch of flowers. Well, all of a sudden, there is a terrific racket at the front door of the Woodcock Inn. And in comes a doll about four feet high and five feet wide. In fact, I never see such a wide doll. She looks all hammered down. Her face is almost as wide as her shoulders, and she makes me think of a great, big, full moon. She comes in pounding in light, and I can see that she's all trained up about something. If she bounces in, I hear a gurgle. And I look around, and I see Walter Winchester slumping down to the floor, almost dragging Miss Billy Perry with him. Well, the wise doll walks right up to the punch under the arch and says in a large, fast voice, Which one of you is Dave the Dude? I'm Dave the Dude, says Dave the Dude, stepping up. What do you mean by busting in here like a walrus and coming up our wedding? Oh, so you're the guy who kidnaps my ever-loving husband to marry him off to this little red-headed pancake here, are you? The wise doll says all of that, and at the same time looking at Dave the Dude, but at the same time pointing at Miss Billy Perry. Well, now, calling Miss Billy Perry a pancake to Dave the Dude is a very serious proposition, and Dave the Dude gets very angry. Now, listen here, Dave the Dude says. You better take a walk before somebody clips you. Well, that's a very good story, sailor, but apparently not the right story. Now, let's go to London. Come in, London. Liberator Station somewhere in England. There was a party at the Aero Club tonight. The long, narrow room had been decorated with Christmas trees and evergreen boughs and red crepe paper. 
30 of the men, compact and ground personnel, enlisted men and officers got together and sang Christmas carols as a part of the program. European field of operations. The night is silent, but this Liberator base never sleeps, even on Christmas Eve. By air, the enemy is only a few minutes away. The men who are safeguarding the present and those who are preparing for the future are hard at work. And one of them whose task is less grim than the others is Technical Sergeant Nicholas L. Visco of Bridgeport, Pennsylvania. What are you doing at this hour of the morning, Sergeant? Hosting turkeys, and the boys realize that a lot of folks are doing without it, so we can have it here. We want to thank them for the small Christmas present. And that goes for all of us. Would you like to know what I'm doing about dessert? Absolutely. It's it's ice cream. We save our rations of powdered milk and powdered eggs, and I got a hold of some cocoa and cornstarch, all of which adds up to ice cream. Ah, good deal, Sergeant. Here's another man who works all around ours. Technical Sergeant John R. Wade of Taunton, Massachusetts, a member of the ground crew. Am I right about the hours, Sergeant? We're on 24-hour call, sir. Even on Christmas Eve. Even on a Christmas Eve. And that's why we brought our microphone to your workshop to let you say Merry Christmas back home tonight. Merry Christmas, Mom and everybody. And now speaking for all the gunners in the European theater is Staff Sergeant John Galanis of Plymouth, Pennsylvania, who has been on 19 missions and wears the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with two clusters. Well, the best way I can put it is this. There's one ship in our group called Heaven Can Wait. It'd be like heaven to be home for Christmas this year, but heaven not only can, but has to wait until our job is finished. For the pilots, navigators, and bombardiers, First Lieutenant Alan L. Green of Oregon City, Oregon. The lieutenant is 21, has been on 17 missions, and wears the distinguished flying cross, the Triple R, and the Air Medal. Lieutenant? Well, I feel the same way the sergeant does. Well, we've enjoyed the presents and the Christmas greetings we've had from home. We'd like to return every Merry Christmas in person, but it's back to duty now. So we might, Ed, we have some Christmas presents and some New Year's resolutions here in England. We're planning to deliver to Hitler in person. From England, the armed forces return to the United States. Well, here we are back in Hollywood. Now from America, where it's still Christmas Eve, we take you where it's already tomorrow. Christmas Day to China. Come in, Chongqing, China. Tonight, all the army men in Chongqing will be dancing at the Victory House as guests of General Shang Jen. There's no snow in Chongqing like we also have back home in Kansas, but we're having about everything else the soldier overseas could have this Christmas. For all the boys in China, a very Merry Christmas and a fine New Year. Now from China, we'd like you to meet some of our buddies and in India. And over here, Marlis, we go from Chongqing to New Delhi. Those boys out there in India evidently can't hear me, but they're definitely on our Christmas list, and we've got a long one tonight. So suppose we try to bring in those fighting Marines at Guadalcanal. And if everything works all right, we will take you to Munda and Guadalcanal. What's the matter with you, Frank? Well, I had to run through my dinner so I have to get you in front of You know how I feel, don't okay? you? Yeah, me too. Dinner, dinner. We're just going to take the dinner. Seaman first class, Frank Irvin. And I, and I am Seaman first class, Jim Hornshaw. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and Frank is from Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, we rushed up to our turkey stuff in that city. Thank you, I have a first class ticket to that far, huh? Not so long ago, just a few weeks back. See, I used to look up out of that Russian wind and a guy that's thinking about folks. Guys just leave, down in Alabama. Well, we'll slow down again. Let's give the folks a hot first. Back up, I think. Well, while we are speaking about Russia, you should feel sorry for your folks back home. They tell us to try to drive over 35 miles an hour. But well, we can't drive over 25. And we even told them to catch a car from the front of the back. Huh, you should have one of the campees off the roof. Well, I bet you just took an idea of dropping. Everyone will say, did you hear? Seaman's first class aren't y'all dropping on the radio electrician. But we're on the manual. Don't worry about us, folks. Uh, we expect you to drop, but don't put it on Christmas. Any more, it's sure a lot better here than it was last year. Last Christmas, almost everything is just the holidays in a foxhole. Well, folks, all we really want to say is a Merry Christmas. It's a tough fight. 
And we'll be home soon, Mom, I hope. And we'll see you in first class fight for the first one in the middle of the field. We'll be able to go to the first one in the middle of the field. And my new little brother, too. And his new little brother, too. And I want to say greetings to my mother and dad, my brothers and sisters in Detroit. Hey, I hope you all with me. This is Tim and First Queen and Tim Orange on Guadalcanal, switching you to London, New Georgia. Go ahead and end up. program spontaneously suggested by American servicemen all over the world to show the folks at home how Christmas is being spent on the front of this global war. This program is being presented by the four major networks. We pause briefly for station identification. Out in the Pacific, our boys have given a mighty good account of themselves, and some of them are spending this Christmas in the hospital. So for a visit with the wounded in New Caledonia, we take you to New Maya. This is New Maya, New Caledonia. It's the afternoon of Christmas Day here. Whether you're at home or getting ready for your Christmas. This program comes to you from the road in an army hospital. There are rows of white cops occupied by our boys who have been injured in battle. Let's listen to Miss Boyer, the day nurse. We're talking to one of the patients. Can Charles tell you making out with that person? I can do it all right. I've got to learn to do things for myself. So, you shouldn't have allowed Sam have to untie a knot with my thumb and third finger. There, I've got it. And I'll start to take you in a jiffy and one of you fine. Golly, Andy and his kids too. I knew you'd figure out how to get me that one. You know you've helped me a lot, Miss Boyer. Every, everybody has. Just think, I'll get you to sing now twice a week over the radio. Why don't you learn to sing, Charles? Back home, that's what I did before the war. My last job was in Baltimore. And when I get back to the States, Don will fix him up with a, with a new load, and he don't need an arm to sing with. 
I'll get along fine when I get that old. I know we're okay. So, Charlie, how about a song? Uh, yes, Put Us White Christmas. Home, get that guitar beside you, Dad, and we'll have a bit of music. Okay, if Charlie would sing. Sure, I'll sing, but I won't. I'll let you a Christmas. <laughs> Up in the windswept Aleutians, the boys are huddled around their stoves talking things over. So let's go to the land of snow and reindeers, to Alaska. A little test from Palestine now. Come in, Alaska. Say, Bing, we're having a little trouble getting Alaska, so step into my office, please. <laughs> Is that what you meant? You look fine tonight. You look well. You look grand. Like my tent? Isn't that a wonderful yeah. thing? What button do you push to get KCA? What are you doing? <laughs> That's the wrong network. We're on KFI. Sorry, yeah. John. Mm. <laughs> do you like this little suit I have on? Yes, looks something like an unmade bed. I... <laughs> Look, you who, look who's talking. Are those your pants or are you dancing with somebody? <laughs> Bing? Hmm. This is a little suit. <laughs> this little suit I had made for me in Pittsburgh. Where were you at the time? I was... <laughs> Nevertheless, I like it, and I'm going to buy it. I think it looks good, don't you? Yes, love it. Do you like that? Mm, why don't you take the, ha the uh, hanger out? I... <laughs> <laughs> Say, listen, I must tell you one thing while we're waiting for Alaska to come in. Yes? Are you there, Alaska? I, uh... <laughs> you know, while I was over in Africa, while I was over in Africa, that, yes. when the man puts his nose, that means we're right there. If he holds it, look out. Look, I want to tell you. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway told me to thank you. He did? For what? Uh, well, I was over in Africa. I met uh, Hemingway, and he told me to well, thank you. Nice to hear. For what? Why well, he, he thank... saw your horses run, and he got the idea for whom the bell tolls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and I had a wonderful time over there. I, is it true that your horses are the only ones that have racks for their canes? Is it true? Lies. All lies. Filthy lies. Filthy lies. My huh? horses haven't much speed, but they have lovely personalities. Oh, <laughs> Horses. They are, they are. Yes. They're some of the finest horses in Dr. Townsend's club. I want to tell you that. <laughs> listen, another thing, listen, Bing, I want to know one thing. Why were you late for rehearsal? Tonight? I couldn't get here any sooner. What do you mean? You well, something get very here. serious happened on the way to the broadcast. I stopped at the stables to see my charges. You did. <laughs> 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 
I just I understand you have new it. stables down there by the uh, Southern Pacific where the where the super chief goes by. Right. The other day, uh, the super chief went by and Bing lined all his horses up and said, "See, that's what I mean." <laughs> David Bing. What? How about this right here? You want to cut in right there? Yes. Christmas Eve and every other night is silent night for the men in the submarine service. But tonight they break their silence to join us around the Christmas tree as we take you aboard a United States submarine. I can use you. Come in at night. I am an electrician mate first class aboard a fleet submarine. In speaking for all submarine men, I want to say to our wives and kids back home, to mother and dad, and to the sweethearts who wait our return... Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from Uncle Sam's Submarines. I am the mail orderly aboard, and for a while my job was pretty tough with all the packages and mail for the crew. How did you make out, Joe? Swell. Enough cigarettes to last two months and a picture of my best gal. And you, Swede? Well, I got a big fruitcake from home, but made the mistake of opening it up in the mess room. <laughs> And how about you, Frenchie? You know, the little woman is living back on the East Coast. Well, I got a card saying, Merry Christmas. Please send check. Rent overdue. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, things must be, must be pretty tough back there. Boy, you said it. How about you, Chief? Well, the best package all of us could get right now is a big, fat Jap cruiser. Right in hell. Yes, sir. Did you see those turkeys Cookie is working on in the galley? Yeah, and all the trimmings, too. Here we go again. Take her down. Level off the periscope depth. Battle station submerged. Hey, Doc, what'd you see up there? Boy, it's a big, fat Jap cruiser dead ahead. We in the Navy are mighty proud of what our buddies in the Marines and the Army have been doing in the Southwest Pacific. So from this submarine, let us go across the Pacific to New Guinea. Come in, New Guinea. Say, we're mighty sorry the boys in New Guinea can't hear us right now. We had them in the line just a moment ago, and this is the message they sent us. It's Christmas Day here in New Guinea. All over this island, American and Australian troops, together with their native helpers, have managed to observe the holiday to the best of their ability. Some were able to sing a carol or two last night, and a surprising number contrived to attend the religious services held last night and still being conducted today from the north bank of the Massawong River to the bomb-scarred chapels at Port Moresby. But everyone found time to open, open his presents and read his mail. Other than these activities, Christmas on New Guinea is a case of it being Saturday and another day of war. Trucks going to war or coming back from the war. Planes are either going out or returning from combat missions. And every once in a while, a line of natives passes by, silent and intent on holding up their end of the fight. I wish you had a chance to talk to some of our boys out here. There is Staff Sergeant Paul Blasewitz, formerly the Bronx of New York City, and now with the Troop Carrier Command. Blasewitz is a tail gunner in a flying fortress. Only they don't carry bombs, they carry freight. They call them fighting freighters because that's where they haul things they've also got to be able to fight. This is his second Christmas out here, but he says this one is a lot better than last year because they're better organized for things like Christmas. For instance, this morning he made his usual run, but by the time he, we hauled some stuff over to the boys at Arroway, that's over on New Britain, and the Japs didn't give us any trouble at all. Just now, Blasewitz is taking it easy, waiting for the next job to come along. And then there are the Australians down here. Boy, what a bunch of fighting men. Just now, many of them are spending their Christmas up in the Ramu Valley. You know, they've got a funny custom in the Australian Army. All of the officers roll up their sleeves and serve the Christmas dinner to the enlisted men. And that's going on today wherever the Aussies are fighting. And that's what's happening out here in New Guinea. We know that all you people back home are working with all your might to make such a broadcast as this completely unnecessary on Christmas Day of 1944. And that's the message. Well, believe me, fellas, we can't wait till the American forces return to the United States, but we realize there still is a big job ahead. 
A very big job to be done on both sides of the war and home fronts. And the sooner we finish both jobs, the sooner our boys will come home. You know, Robin, the Navy is doing a huge share of that job, too. Boy, you can say that again, Bing. Let's cut in on Christmas Eve doings on one of Uncle Sam's mighty battle wagons. To greet the holy night That gave the world its Christmas rose Its king of love and love This is Christmas Eve with the Blue Jackets aboard a United States battleship. Listen while Blue Jacket McMillan, seaman first class, is singing Jesu Bambino for the ship's crew. Chester William Smith, who is an emceeing the fun for the crew. Chet, are the boys having a good time? Yes, sir. Did the men get all their packages and mail from home? You bet. And all those packages and all that mail made it a great Christmas. Okay, fella. We know you're going to top it all off with a grand turkey dinner tomorrow, but right now, let's get back over there with the band and sailing fish. <laughs> Big battle wagon. We take you to the boys guarding our lifeline on the Big Ditch at Panama. This is Corporal Harvey Chester speaking from Panama. With me is Corporal Wesley Parsons, one of the men who carved out the jungle positions protecting the canal. What are the boys doing at your position tonight, Wes? 100% of them are thinking about Christmas back home. Well, so am I, but that's not all, I hope. No, as a matter of fact, the boys are having a Christmas dance right now. For the first time since we put in that position, there are some girls there. I'll bet that Christmas party is different from the ones back home. It sure is. Instead of snow on the ground, we have green grass. There's a warm breeze and the birds are singing. Oh, well, how about Christmas services, Wes? There aren't enough chaplains to go to all positions, but we'll hear the midnight service over the radio. Turkey dinner tomorrow? You bet, with all the trimmings. I'm going to wish a Merry Christmas to my folks in Charleston, West Virginia, Wes. Where are yours? Detroit, Michigan. Merry Christmas. From the jungles of Panama, and with a Christmas greeting to all, we take you to Hawaii. This is Sergeant Merle Miller of the United States Army speaking from the Central Pacific area. Naturally, our thoughts turn toward home on this third Christmas Eve since Pearl Harbor, and all of us wish we could be with our families and friends. We're not exactly without friends, but no matter how well you get along with your buddies, they don't take the place of the folks you've left behind. If opening gifts and having a good dinner were all, Christmas overseas would leave little to be desired, but of course, there's more to it than that. However, there's going to be plenty of turkey all around, and most of us already have received a generous stack of mail from home. Summing up our observation of the news from the home front, we wonder if victory couldn't be stepped up if there was less time spent on small-town politics, labor disputes, and ballyhoo. We're not kicking, we just wonder. Over here, where all work is considered essential war work, the activities of the civilian and military population are not too widely separated. We still have a 10 o'clock curfew and blackout and early closing hours in town. Taking everything into consideration, we're pretty well off. That was Sergeant Merle Miller, Bureau Chief of Yanks Pacific Edition. Standing by at a vantage point overlooking Pearl Harbor is Marine Private First Class Harry A. Jackson. This 19-year-old Marine from Pitchfork, Wyoming, was in the first wave that stormed the beaches of Tarawa in the Gilberts. Come in, Private Jackson. 
Since December 7, 1941, when Christmas was all but totally blacked out, Pearl Harbor is slowly but surely being avenged. Coral Sea, Midway, Guadalcanal, Kiska, and Attu. And now the Gilbert. And after you've been through Tarawa, you begin to realize, maybe for the first time in your life, what Christmas is all about. It's a lot more important to you. And I don't mean just getting presents either. On Tarawa, you don't think a hell of a lot about Christmas. But on Christmas, you think a hell of a lot about Tarawa. Us fellas that are fighting out this way are backed by a vast civilian force of skilled workers at Pearl Harbor, whose job it is to keep us and our gear fit to fight. These Pearl Harbor workers are able to take time out this Christmas to celebrate the birth of him who promised peace on Earth. But the pause this Christmas will be a brief one, because every fighting one of us is on the road that leads to Tokyo, and Tokyo knows we're on the way. From Pearl Harbor, where the stars and stripes still fly, and the Christmas tree lights are on again, it's a Merry Christmas to you all at home. 2,000 years ago, a star shone down over Bethlehem, and the angels heralded peace on earth, goodwill to men. Today, there is no peace, and goodwill is shriveled in the flame and smoke of battle, in the hatred and greed of men. Today, the star of Bethlehem shines down on gleaming bayonets, and the three wise men no longer roam the plains of Judea, bearing gifts and ointments. Today, there are tanks bearing death and destruction, stalking the plains of the earth in search of human prey. And yet, the star still shines over Bethlehem, and there are still men of goodwill in every nook and corner of the earth, fighting and praying that peace may be restored to the world, that men may learn how to live with one another in peace and tranquility, that their children may walk in the majesty of the Lord, unafraid and unopposed. We take you now to Bethlehem, where the star and promise shine forth as they did 2,000 years ago. It's four in the morning here, so we're speaking to you from Christmas Day. After the traditional services at Bethlehem, which marked again the birth night of our Savior. Here with me are Chaplain James A. Carey and two typical American soldiers. Sergeant Robert Bowler of Brooklyn and Sergeant Earl Getchoff of Detroit. They're speaking to you from the Holy Land as representatives of the American Army in the Middle East. Earl, will you go first? Tonight, I knelt with 60 other American boys on the side of the stable where Christ was born. An American chaplain officiated at a mass there. It was only one of many such services, but it was the first participation of the American Army in the Bethlehem ceremony. It certainly was fine, wasn't it, Earl? I kept remembering, as I watched the ceremonies in the church and the nativity, that Christmas had been celebrated there for 1,600 years. Me too, Walter. It's been a Christmas Eve I'll never forget. The church was filled with uniformed men, Americans, British and Polish. So I knew there was still a war on, but somehow or other, I felt there would soon be peace on earth again. And you, Chaplain Kern? My only viewpoint now springs from my job as chief of Middle East chaplain. I want to tell all you people back home that some of your boys have had a very fine experience. It seems to me that they will be finer men and finer Americans for having made this pilgrimage to the birthplace of our Lord. And now, as the star of Bethlehem shines down, the Middle East Armed Forces return you to the United States.
today the president delivered an important address to many of our people stationed overseas and to those of us at home. In order that those who didn't hear his message may have an opportunity to hear it, we present a recording of that speech. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends, I have recently returned from extensive journeyings in the region of the Mediterranean and as far as the borders of Russia. I have conferred with the leaders of Britain and Russia and China on military matters of the present, especially on plans for stepping up our successful attack on our enemies as quickly as possible and from many different points of the compass. On this Christmas Eve, there are over 10 million men in the armed forces of the United States alone. One year ago, 1,700,000 were serving overseas. Today, this figure has been more than doubled to 3,800,000 on duty overseas. And by next July 1st, that number overseas will rise to over 5 million men and women. That this is truly a world war was demonstrated to me when arrangements were being made with our overseas broadcasting agencies for the time for me to speak today to our soldiers and sailors and marines and merchant seamen in every part of the world. In fixing the time for this broadcast, we took into consideration that at this moment here in the United States and in the Caribbean and on the northeast coast of South America, it is afternoon. In Alaska and in Hawaii and the mid-Pacific, it is still morning. In Iceland, in Great Britain, in North Africa, in Italy, in the Middle East, it is now evening. In the southwest Pacific, in Australia and China and Burma and India, it is already Christmas Day. So we can correctly say that at this moment, in those eastern, those far eastern parts, where Americans are fighting, today is tomorrow. But everywhere throughout the world, through this war that covers the world, there is a special spirit that has warmed our hearts since our earliest childhood. A spirit that brings us close to our homes, our families, our friends and neighbors. The Christmas spirit of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It is an unquenchable spirit. During the past years of international gangsterism and brutal aggression in Europe and in Asia, our Christmas celebrations have been darkened with apprehension for the future. We have said Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, but we have known in our hearts that the clouds which have hung over our world have prevented us from saying it with full sincerity and conviction. But even this year, we still have much to face in the way of further suffering and sacrifice and personal tragedy. Our men who have been through the fierce battles in the Solomons and the Gilberts and Tunisia and Italy know from their own experience and knowledge of modern war that many bigger and costlier battles are still to be fought. But on Christmas Eve this year, I can say to you that at last we may look forward into the future with real substantial confidence that however great the cost, peace on earth, goodwill toward men can be and will be realized and ensured. This year I can say that. Last year, I could not do more than express a hope. Today, I express a certainty, though the cost may be high and the time may be long. Within the past year, within the past few weeks, history has been made. And it is far better history for the whole human race than any that we've known or even dared to hope for in these tragic times through which we pass. A great beginning was made in the Moscow Conference last October 
by Mr. Molotov, Mr. Eden, and our own Mr. Hull. There and then the way was paved for the later meetings. At Cairo and Tehran, we devoted ourselves not only to military matters, we devoted ourselves also to consideration of the future, to plans for the kind of world which alone can justify all the sacrifices of this war. Of course, as you all know, Mr. Churchill and I have happily met many times before, and we know and un understand each other very well. Indeed, Mr. Churchill has become known and beloved by many millions of Americans, and the heartfelt prayers of all of us have been with this great citizen of the world in his recent serious illness. The Cairo and Tehran conferences, however, gave me my first opportunity to meet the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek, and Marshal Stalin, and to sit down at the table with these unconquerable men and talk with them face to face. We had planned to talk to each other across the table at Cairo and Tehran, but we soon found that we were all on the same side of the table. We came to the conferences with faith in each other, but we needed the personal contact. And now we have supplemented faith with definite knowledge. It was well worth traveling thousands of miles over land and sea to bring about this personal meeting and to gain the heartening assurance that we are absolutely agreed with one another on all the major objectives and on the military means of obtaining them. At Cairo, Prime Minister Churchill and I spent four days with the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek. It was the first time that we'd had an opportunity to go over the complex situation in the Far East with him personally. We were able not only to settle upon definite military strategy, but also to discuss certain long-range principles which we believe can assure peace in the Far East for many generations to come. Those principles are as simple as they are fundamental. They involve the restoration of stolen property to its rightful owners and the recognition of the rights of millions of people in the Far East to build up their own forms of self-government without molestation. Essential to all peace and security in the Pacific and in the rest of the world is the permanent elimination of the empire of Japan as a potential force of aggression. Never again must our soldiers and sailors and marines and other soldiers and sailors and marines be compelled to fight from island to island as they are fighting so gallantly and so successfully today. Increasingly powerful forces are now hammering at the Japanese at many points over an enormous arc which curves down through the Pacific from the Aleutians to the jungles of Burma. Our own army and navy, our air forces, the Australians and New Zealanders, the Dutch and the British land, air and sea forces are all forming a band of steel which is slowly but surely closing in on Japan. And on the mainland of Asia, under the Generalissimo's leadership, the Chinese ground and air forces, augmented by American air forces, are playing a vital part in starting the drive which will push the invaders into the sea. Following out the military decisions at Cairo, General Marshall has just flown around the world and has had conferences with General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, conferences which will spell plenty of bad news for the Japs in the not too far distant future. <coughs> I met in the, <coughs> in the Generalissimo a man of great vision, great courage, and a remarkably keen understanding of the problems of today and tomorrow. We discussed all the manifold military plans for striking at Japan with a decisive force 
from many directions. And I believe I can say that he returned to Chongqing with the positive assurance of total victory over our common enemy. Today, Today, we and the Republic of China are closer together than ever before in deep friendship and in unity of purpose. After the Cairo conference, Mr. Churchill and I went by airplane to Tehran. There, we met with Marshal Stalin. We talked with complete frankness on every conceivable subject connected with the winning of the war and the establishment of a durable peace after the war. Within three days of intense and consistently amicable discussions, we agreed on every point concerned with the launching of a gigantic attack upon Germany. The Russian army will continue its stern offensives on Germany's eastern front. The Allied armies in Italy and Africa will bring relentless pressure on Germany from the south. And now the encirclement will be complete as great American and British forces attack from other points of the compass. The commander selected to lead the combined attack from these other points is General Dwight D. Eisenhower. His performances in Africa, in Sicily, and in Italy have been brilliant. He knows by practical and successful experience the way to coordinate air, sea, and land power. All of these will be under his control. Lieutenant General Carl Spratz will command the entire American strategic bombing force operating against Germany. General Eisenhower gives up his command in the Mediterranean to a British officer whose name is being announced by Mr. Churchill. We now pledge that new commander that our powerful ground, sea, and air forces in the vital Mediterranean area will stand by his side until every objective in that bitter theater is attained. Both of these new commanders will have American and British subordinate commanders whose names will be announced to the world in a few days. During the last two days in Tehran, Marshal Stalin, Mr. Churchill, and I looked ahead, ahead to the days and months and years that will follow Germany's defeat. We were united in determination that Germany must be stripped of her military might and be given no opportunity within the foreseeable future to regain that might. The United Nations have no intention to enslave the German people. We wish them to have a normal chance to develop in peace as useful and respectable members of the European family. But we most certainly emphasize that word respectable for we intend to rid them once and for all of Nazism and Prussian militarism and the fantastic and disastrous notion that they constitute the master race. We did discuss international relationships from the point of view of big, broad objectives rather than details. But on the basis of what we did discuss, I can say even today but I do not think any insoluble differences will arise among Russia, Great Britain, and the United States. In these conferences, we were concerned with basic principles, principles which involve the security and the welfare and the standard of living of human beings in countries large and small and somewhat ungrammatical colloquialism, I may say that I got along fine with Marshal Stalin. He is a man who combines a tremendous, relentless determination with a stalwart good humor. I believe he is truly representative of the heart and soul of Russia. 
And I believe that we are going to get along very well with him and the Russian people. Very well indeed. Britain, Russia, China, and the United States and their allies represent more than three quarters of the total population of the Earth. As long as these four nations, with great military power, stick together in determination to keep the peace, there will be no possibility of an aggressor nation arising to start another world war. But those four powers must be united with and cooperate with the freedom-loving peoples of Europe and Asia and Africa and the Americas. The rights of every nation, large or small, must be respected and guarded as jealously as are the rights of every individual within our own republic. The doctrine that the strong shall dominate the weak is the doctrine of our enemies, and we reject it. But at the same time, we're agreed that if force is necessary to keep international peace, international force will be applied for as long as it may be necessary. It has been our steady policy, and it is certainly a common sense policy, that the right of each nation to freedom must be measured by the willingness of that nation to fight for freedom. And today we salute our unseen allies in occupied countries, the underground resistance groups, and the armies of liberation. They will provide potent forces against our enemies when the day of the counter-invasion comes. Through the development of science, the world has become so much smaller that we have had to discard the geographical yardsticks of the past. For instance, through our early history, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans were believed to be walls of safety for the United States. Time and distance made it physically possible, for example, for us and for the other American republics to obtain and maintain independence against infinitely stronger powers. Until recently, very few people, even military experts, thought that the day would ever come when we might have to defend our Pacific coast against Japanese threats of invasion. At the outbreak of the First World War, relatively few people thought that our ships and shipping would be menaced by German submarines on the high seas or that the German militarists would ever attempt to dominate any nation outside of Central Europe. After the armistice in 1918, we thought and hoped that the militaristic philosophy of Germany had been crushed. And being uh, full of the milk of human kindness, we spent the next 20 years disarming, while the Germans, whined so pathetically that the other nations permitted them and even helped them to rearm. For too many years, we lived on pious hopes that aggressor and warlike nations would learn and understand and carry out the doctrine of purely voluntary peace. The well-intentioned but ill-fated experiments of former years did not work. It is my hope that we will not try them again. No, that is putting it too weakly. It is my intention to do all that I humanly can as President and Commander-in-Chief to see to it that these tragic mistakes shall not be made again. There have always been cheerful idiots in this country who believe that there would be no more war for us if everybody in America would only return into their homes and lock their front doors behind them, assuming that their motives were of the highest, events have shown how unwilling they were to face the facts. 
The overwhelming majority of all the people in the world want peace. Most of them are fighting for the attainment of peace. Not just a truce, not just an armistice, but peace that is as strongly enforced and as durable as mortal man can make it. If we are willing to fight for peace now, is it not good logic that we should use force if necessary in the future to keep the peace? I believe and I think I can say that the other three great nations who are fighting so magnificently to gain peace are in complete agreement that we must be prepared to keep the peace by force. If the people of Germany and Japan are made to realize thoroughly that the world is not going to let them break out again, it is possible and I hope probable that they will abandon the philosophy of aggression, the belief that they can gain the whole world, even at the risk of losing their own souls. I shall have more to say about the Cairo and Tehran conferences when I make my report to the Congress in about two weeks' time. And on that occasion, I shall also have a great deal to say about certain conditions here at home. <clears throat> but today, I wish to say that in all my travels at home and abroad, it is the sight of our soldiers and sailors and their magnificent achievements which have given me the greatest inspiration and the greatest encouragement for the future. To the members of our armed forces, to their wives, mothers, and fathers, I want to affirm the great faith and confidence that we have in General Marshall and Admiral King, who direct all of our armed might throughout the world. Upon them falls the responsibility of planning the strategy, of determining where and when we shall fight. Both of these men have already gained high places in American history, places which will record in that history many evidences of their military genius that cannot be published today. Some of our men overseas are now spending their third Christmas far from home. To them and to all others overseas, or soon to go overseas, I can give assurance that it is the purpose of their government to win this war and to bring them home at the earliest possible time. And we here in the United States had better be sure that when our soldiers and sailors do come home, they will find an America in which they are given full opportunities for education and rehabilitation and social security and employment and business enterprise under the free American system and that they will find a government which, by their votes as American citizens, they have had a full share in electing. The American people have had every reason to know that this is a tough and destructive war. On my trip abroad, I talked with many military men who had faced our enemies in the field. These hard-headed realists testify to the strength and skill and resourcefulness of the enemy generals and men whom we must beat before final victory is won. The war is now reaching the stage where we shall all have to look forward to large casualty lists, dead, wounded, and missing. War entails just that. There is no easy road to victory, and the end is not yet in sight. I have been back only for a week. It is fair that I should tell you my impression. I think I see a tendency in some of our people here to assume a quick ending of the war. The war and the result means false reasoning. I think I discern an effort to resume 
or even encourage an outbreak of partisan thinking and talking. I hope I am wrong, for surely our first and most foremost tasks are all concerned with winning the war and winning a just peace that will last for generations. <coughs> the massive offensives which are in the making, <coughs> both in Europe and the Far East, will require every ounce of energy and fortitude that we and our allies can summon on the fighting fronts and in all the workshops at home. As I have said before, you cannot order up a great attack on a Monday and demand that it be delivered on Saturday. Less than a month ago, I flew in a big army transport plane over the little town of Bethlehem in Palestine. Tonight on Christmas Eve, all men and women everywhere who love Christmas are thinking of that ancient town and of the star of faith that shone there more than 19 centuries ago. American boys are fighting today in snow-covered mountains, in malarial jungles, on blazing deserts. They are fighting on the far stretches of the sea and above the clouds, fighting the thing that they, for which they struggle, I think is best symbolized by the message that came out of Bethlehem. On behalf of the American people, your own people, I send this Christmas message to you, to you who are in our armed forces. In our hearts are prayers for you and for all your comrades in arms who fight to rid the world of evil. We ask God's blessing upon you, upon your fathers and mothers and wives and children, all your loved ones at home. We ask that the comfort of God's grace shall be granted to those who are sick and wounded and to those who are prisoners of war in the hands of the enemy waiting for the day when they will again be free. And we ask that God receive and cherish those who have given their lives and that he keep them in honor and in the grateful memory of their countrymen forever. God bless all of you who fight our battles on this Christmas Eve. God bless us all. Keep us strong in our faith that we fight for a better day for humankind, here and everywhere. You have just heard the voice of the President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. <laughs> This concludes the special Christmas Eve program conceived by the boys who are far from home this Christmas season. They wanted their loved ones to know how they were observing this day away from home.
In order that we might bring you the special program just concluded, the following programs, usually heard over many of these stations, were canceled tonight. Amos and Andy, Bill Stern Sports Newsreel, Fred Waring in Pleasure Time, and Fleetwood Lawton. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thank mm-hmm. you.